Greetings once again in the name that is above every other name, the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to our addiction, and this is your host, Reverend Lawrence Makumbi from Life Pool Chapel Kitengela, the house of, of faith. And today, God has enabled us to be here that we may be able to study His word from the first uh, book of Samuel, chapters number 28, all the way to chapter number 31. So, by His grace and His faithfulness, we are coming to the end of the first book of Samuel today. And tomorrow, as he enables us, we'll be able to begin the second book of the prophet Samuel. So why don't we uh, just begin with a word of prayer and look into his word, what it has in store for us uh, today. Father, we thank you. We glorify your name, the most excellent, the most glorious, the most gracious God there is. Lord, there is none like you. You tower above all the others. Your love and kindness, your mercies, and your faithfulness have got testimonies from eternity to eternity. Lord, your goodness has been revealed to each and every one of us in your own due time. Lord, how we pray today. You've given us the grace from Genesis. Now today we are coming to the end of the first book of Samuel. And Lord, you've been gracious and faithful to us. May you receive all the glory and may you receive all the honor. And so we are praying that today, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the author and the revealer of this word, that you shall speak to us vividly and with conviction and grant us the grace to apply your word in our lives. We give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we do trust, praying and believing. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 28, verses 1. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel and Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Verses 3, now Samuel had died and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own town, in his own city. And Saul had put up mediums and spirits and spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and said, Please conduct a science for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul saw to her by the, by, by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you uh, for this uh, thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are a soul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And he said to her, What is this? What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? 
And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God has departed from me and does not answer me any more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full, uh, full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look! Your maid servant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life, I have put my life in my hands, and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now, therefore, please heed also the voice of your maid servant, and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you when you go on your way. But he refused and said, "I will not eat." So his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted uh, calf in the house, and she hastened to kill it, and she took flour and kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away at that night. So here we see a couple of uh, scenarios coming up. The conversation between David and Akish. Remember, David... Um, uh, is uh, living with Akish and uh, Akish tries to hire or speaks out to hire David uh, to be on his side and uh, to be in charge uh, or, or a chief guardian before him forever. And then from there the scripture begins uh, to, to tell us the events that befall Saul after the death of Samuel. And one of the things that arise from here is that it is so clear that Saul had commanded all the mediums, the people who are spiritists, the people who are, uh, who are actually performing um, uh, witchcraft and sorcery. Actually, that's what they were, because that's what mediums are actually. Uh, they use what we call familiar spirits, and we shall look at it as we go on. So Saul decides, do you know what? Uh, let me, because Philistines is, the Philistines are coming to war against us. Let me go and inquire from the Lord. He goes and inquires from the Lord. And the scripture says uh, uh, that number one, he was afraid in verses five, and his heart trembled greatly. When he was uh, attacked or he, was, he saw the Philistines coming against him, the heart of Saul was afraid. And remember, we said that the source of fear in a leader or in the life of any person when you have fear against your enemy, it means that you are not conscious of God's presence with you. So I believe the reason why Saul was uh, full of fear at this moment when the Philistines were charging against the children of Israel, it is because they, he knew or he felt or he was assured that the presence of God was not with him. And so what does he do? As his heart is trembling greatly, verse 6 says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. In other words, the heavens were shut towards Saul. So he made an inquiry. The Lord did not answer him. Either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. So the, all the avenues that you know Saul thought that God would use to answer him, whether it's by vision or dreams, God did not answer. Whether it is through the priest with the Urim and the Thurim, 
God did not answer. Neither did he use any prophet in Israel, living out of Israel, to answer Saul. So when Saul discovered this, he discovered, you know what? The Lord is silent to me. Instead of going to inquire now, God, I'm not inquiring now against Philistine. I want to inquire between me and you. Why aren't you answering me? But I believe deep down he knew God was silent because God had torn away the kingdom of Israel from him and handed it over to David. So what, what happens when God does not answer? You know, there are moments that you go before the presence of God and there is something that is so pressing and you just want God to perform, you just want God to speak and it seems that God is silent. I believe is it uh, Francis Schaeffer that wrote uh, the book uh, entitled He is There and He is Not Silent. God always speaks. God has got a way and avenues of speaking. He primarily speaks to us through his word as we are reading it as today. He speaks to us through his word. God can speak to you through visions. God can speak to you through uh, dreams. God can uh, communicate to you when you're in a trance. God can communicate to you through uh, you know, the inner still voice. God can communicate to you through the fivefold ministry. God can communicate to you, uh, 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 you know, through the events that occur in daily life. But as God communicates to you, everything must be consistent with his written word. God speaks, and you should know that God speaks. And when God is not speaking, or when God is not answering, take some time and ask yourself, you know what, genuinely, I want to know. Why is God so silent towards me? Why is God so silent towards me? God would have answered. God would have used another avenue to answer to Saul and tell him, do you know what? Don't even bother going to Philistines because you're going to lose that war. For the kingdom of declared has already been torn away from you. Make it a habit when you're asking God something and God is silent. Don't rush. Don't look for a second opinion. Don't look for help from man first. Go back to God and ask him, God, what is wrong with me? If there is an answer, if there is something, if there is a prayer that I know God has never delayed to answer in my life, is that one. God, what is wrong between me and you? He may delay to answer some things that I've asked from him. But when it comes to personal issues with my heart and my relationship with him, God does not delay. Why? Because God is so much interested in your own well-being, spiritual well-being. God is so much interested in your relationship with him, even more than the progress that you have in life. Because he knows if your relationship with him is right, then the success that you seek from him will come in your life. So if Saul had said, you know what? God is not speaking to me through my dream, uh, through dreams or through a vision. He has not spoken to me through the priest, through the Urim and the Thurim or the effort. God has not, has, hasn't spoken to me through his prophets. Now, God, I want to know. Now, between me and you, what is ailing what? What is it in my relationship with you? Are? And God will have spoken to him. But what does he do? He says that Saul went and he said... Uh, because there are no mediums in Israel. They have been cast out of Israel. They have not been killed. And remember the Lord said, you shall not suffer a witch to live. Because actually mediums, it's sorcery. They are actually doing a sorcery. And the scriptures is so clear about sorcery that you shall not suffer a witch to live. But what did Saul do? Because of his insecurity and because I believe he knew that God was not going to speak to him again. He kept himself a uh, uh, you know, he preserved these people out of Israel just in case God does not speak to me, I will go to them. And that's exactly what he did. And most of the times you'll, you'll discover that when God is silent, you, th th there, is, there is like um, a backup plan that you have kept for yourself that in case God is silent, I will go and seek brother so and so to help me out. In case God does not uh, provide a, a way for me, I will go to sister so-and-so and she will sort me out. As long as you have a backup plan, God will never speak. If God is not your only option, if you have any other option around you, God is not obligated to perform. 
And that's what has killed a lot of faith in the believers and it has killed uh, the relationships between uh, believers and their God. As long as you feel you have options and God is not your only option, your faith and your eyesight is not unto him. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that set your eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. In other words, when you're coming before God, come knowing this, that I have got no options. You know, I've seen a lot of miracles happen to people who are sick and they don't have money to access medical uh, health. They don't have a medical insurance and they know the only hope they have, it is God himself. I've seen miracles happen there more than those people who feel I have an insurance card. Is it bad to have an insurance card? No. But when God is your only option, your faith and your spiritual eyesight is nowhere else but it is in God. So Saul knew that even if God does not speak, through the avenues that have been mentioned there, I can still go and consult a medium somewhere. And that's what he did. And what mediums do, they use what we call a familiar spirit. A spirit that looks as if it is God doing something. But it is actually a, 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 a deception. That's why we talk about in the book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number... 12. First Corinthians chapter number 12, it talks about um, what do we call uh, spiritual gifts. And one of the spiritual gifts is the discernment of a spirit, the distinguishment between spirits, so that you may know, is it the spirit of God, is it the spirit of the devil, or is it what we call a human spirit? So as a believer, there are many things that will look as if there are solutions from God. And there are very many communications that you may get in contact with in the spiritual world. You need the spirit of discernment to distinguish between the spirits. Whether it is the spirit of God, whether it is a human spirit, or whether it is an evil spirit. Why? Because the enemy is a counterfeit. There are a lot of people who have been led astray. Actually, when you start reading um, biographies of men of God, there are people who are men of God were mightily used by God, but, an, but the enemy came as an angel of the light and started teaching them a very wrong doctrine. And they thought because this is a very supernatural and spectacular thing, it must be God. And most of them were, some of them were, hey, they were so strong. That's what the Bible says um, when Jesus Christ speaks in the book of Matthew, I believe is it in chapter number 24. He says, and in the last days, in those last days, even the elect, shall be deceived. Even those who seem to be strong, even those who seem to have, uh, you know, matured over time, there is the possibility of the elect to be deceived. The spirit of discernment is very, very critical. You need to be in a place whereby you can, you know, you can distinguish between the spirits that are operating in your life. No, is it God is it the spirit of a man or is it the evil spirit? Saul never had this discernment because the presence of God had departed from him. And what does Saul tell him when, uh, when the familiar spirit comes? He tells him, listen, you shall join me. You and your sons by tomorrow, as you fight against the Philistines, you shall join me. In other words, you are going to die. And this thing, you know, and this thing was... Um, a disturbance to Saul. It really affected his life. It really affected his life. And uh, he became so weak, he fell off that they, you know, they had to beg him to eat. They had to beg him to eat because he was so weak. And, you know, he, he obliged and his strength was revived. And let us see how this thing plays from here. But please, when you're seeking God, Allow God to be the only option that you have. If you have a side, uh, you know, a plan B somewhere, plan C somewhere, some of us have got up to plan Z. In case God fails, plan B is Tom. In case Tom fails, plan C is Shaniko. In case Shaniko fails, plan D is so and so, E, F. You've got a lot of things aligned and you say you're going to seek God. If you want to see God operate, make him the only option. 
When you go before him and say, God, I've got nowhere else to go. It is only you. And it is you that I'm seeking. It is you that I'm believing in. God will come through for you. But if you seek God with a, you know, a mixed mindset, you may end up missing God terribly and terribly. Chapter 29 verses 1. Then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Aphek and the Israelites encamped by a fountain which is in Jezreel. The lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed in review at the rear with Akish. Then the princes of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Akish said to the princes of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me these days or these years? And to this day I have found no fault in him since he defected to me. So the Philistines, the, the, other, uh, the princes of the Philistines, look at David and say, Look at the Hebrews and say, who are these Hebrews? What are they doing here? We cannot go to war against Israel and we've got uh, uh, part of them as our army. And Akish says, ah, isn't this David? Don't you know David? He was a servant of Saul, but he, he defected from Saul and he has been with me all these years. Since then, I've never found fault in him. But the princes of Philistines who are angry with him, so the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fellow return, that he may go back to the place which you have appointed for him, and do not let him go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. For with, for with what could he reconcile himself to his master, if not to the heads of these men? Is this not David whom they sang to one another in dancing, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands? Then Akish called David and said to him, Surely, as the Lord lives, you have been upright, underline that, and your going out and your coming out with me in the army is good in my sight. For this day I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, the lords do not favor you. Therefore, return now and go in peace, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So David said to Akish, but what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I have been with you that I may not go and fight against the enemies of the Lord, the king? Then Akish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in, 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 in my sight as the angel of God. Underline that. Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. Departed from him, or he has deserted him as a, as, as, as a leader. But the princes are telling him, no, no, no. This is David. If he has fallen off with his master soul, what reward can he use to make sure that soul loves him more and has brought him back, if not the heads of this man? In other words, David can turn against us in battle and kill us and present our heads to Saul and tell him, Saul, I am David. I am for you. I am not against you. Here are the heads of the people of Philistine. It will be accepted. So they looked at him and they're playing politics here. There's, there's no hard feelings. They're saying, this guy is indeed the one that people are singing praises for him and saying, he, to, uh, uh, saying about him uh, concerning us Philistines. That Saul has killed a thousand and David tens of thousand. Ha, we cannot trust this fellow. And then Akish turns to David and says, David, before the Lord, you know I have lived with you faithfully. You have been so faithful and you've been trustworthy to me. But these princesses don't trust you. Between me and you, between me and you he says what? He says uh, uh, that you are as good good in my sight as an angel of God. I love that. That when David was with Akish, Akish saw David like this and he said, you know what David, Between, in my sight, before my sight, you are as good to me as an angel of God. That's how David carried himself. And I believe that's the nature that, was, that lied in David that made God, you know, trust David all his life. Because before people David was the man to have. Before his enemies, David was the man to have. 
when Saul sought his face and sought his life. You remember we read it yesterday? That Saul told David, David, listen, you, before God, before you and me and before God, you have acted more righteously than I have. God saw David's heart and his heart was always upright before God. Do you know there are people when they go before God, their hearts are upright, but in their interrelationships with other men, oh no. You can't believe that the same person who is so bare before God, he, 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 he acts like a wild animal before his brethren. David was consistent. His love to God, his love before God, and his love before men was the same. David won the trust of many around him, and many around him loved him. Chapter number 13. Uh, chapter number 30. Uh, verses uh, 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the woman and those who were there from a small to great. They did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city and there it was burned with fire and their wives, their sons, uh, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power uh, to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoham, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of a stone in him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, and he and the six hundred men who were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those, uh, where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued he and the 400 men, for, two, uh, for 200 stayed behind, who were so weary that they could not cross the brook of, Beor, of Besor. Then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David, uh, brought him to David and they gave him bread and he ate, and they let, them drink, uh, let him uh, drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drank water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, To whom do you belong? And where are you from? And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. And, uh, and my master left me behind because, uh, uh, because uh, three days ago I fell sick. He made an invasion of the south area of the, of the Cherethites in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb and we burned down Ziglag with fire. And David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? So he said, swear to me by God that you will never kill me nor deliver me into the hands of, them, of my master and I will take you down to this uh, troop. And when he had brought him down there, they were spread out over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of uh, Judah. Then David attacked them from twilight until evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Verses 20. Then David took all the flocks and herds they had driven before, uh, before, those, other, uh, before those other livestock and said, This is David's spoil. So here we see David has come back from Akish. And as they go back to Ziglag, they discover their camps have been raided. Their wives have been taken captives and their children have been taken captives. And you know the 
the other property that remains have been burnt down by the Amalekites. So this thing discouraged David so much. And it discouraged the men so much that even the men felt, you know what, David? Oh, no. As a leader, you failed us here. We don't have homes. We don't have wives. We don't have children. We don't have property. So they even thought of stoning and killing David. But the Bible says that David strengthened himself in the Lord is God. This should be a lesson for all of us. When things are not going up rightly, when you have fallen uh, a victim to loss in your life, when things have come against you, teach yourself to encourage yourself before the presence of God. Because there are people who will be around you and they'll be looking at you as if you are the cause of their pain, you are the cause of their loss, you are the cause of their destruction, and they don't want to be there with you. Some of them are your friends, some of them are your family. You could be a man who've made a decision, you know, to invest somewhere and you've lost money. Your life thinks that, your, your, your life your wife thinks that you've betrayed the family. You're making the family suffer. And it is true. It is because of that decision that you made. But be like David. David discovered, you know what? I have failed somewhere as a leader. But there is an option. Abiathar the priest, please bring the effort. I want to inquire from God. Now here is the difference between David and Saul. David requires, uh, makes a request for Abiathar the priest to bring the effort and inquires before God. And he says, God, God. Will, if I, should I pursue these people, number one? If I pursue them, will I recover? When Saul asked about the Philistines, God was silent. When David asked about the Amalekites, God spoke to him. And God told him, listen, pursue them. I've given you the permission. Pursue them. In concerning recovering, you will recover. You shall pursue and you shall overtake and you shall recover every single property and family and wife and child that has been taken from you. And David got strength in encouraging himself in the Lord because the word of the Lord was spoken to him. Listen, you might be weak now. You might feel defeated now. You might feel like a failure now. But as you seek the face of the Lord, the word that God shall speak to you will encourage your heart, will encourage your spirit, will encourage your body, will encourage your soul, and you'll be able to pursue the things that you feel that you ought to pursue in life. But if you don't inquire of the Lord, you'll become like the 200 men who are so weak and they'll not pursue. Make it a habit. Whenever you are in a place of destruction and you feel that it's failure, make it a habit to seek after God like David sought after the Lord. Encourage yourself in his word. Encourage yourself in the closet. Seek his face. Seek his voice. Let the Lord speak. Speak his word in your life and his word shall be a strength to your very wounded soul or a spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Be like David. And the Bible says as David pursued, he came across an Egyptian slave. And what it teaches here us is this. As David was ministering to him, giving the slave what he requires, through the slave, David received what he required. And this is a very key principle in life. When you help others get what they want, God will help you receive what you want in life. Humanity, the way God created humanity is that you are dependent on one another. When you help someone else to achieve their dream, when you help someone else meet their need, God will help you meet yours. So when David was taking care of this uh, 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 Egyptian uh, slave, he received direction from the same slave of where the Amalekites have gone. And when David ministered to the needs of this Egyptian slave, you may think this is a slave, he's about to die. Uh, you know, let him go. No, David was kind enough to minister to his needs. He gave him something to eat and water to drink. And the Egyptian was revived and he discovered, you know what? These people have been kind enough to me. I will tell them about my master and I'll tell them about where the Amalekites have gone. And it gave David direction. And when David went there, he got a restoration. Not only was his family restored, not only was his property restored, but more than his property and more than his family was restored. Verse 21. Now David came to the 200 men who had been so wary that they could not follow David, whom they also had made to stay at the brook Besor. 
So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoils that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered us into our hand, into the hand and the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is he who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be, who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. So it was from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel up to this day. So what happens? The people come with a loot. They meet the 200 who are left behind and they said, we are greeting you. But listen, we will only give you back your wives and your children and depart from us. They've said no. The ones who stayed back with the supplies and the ones who went to war, let us share equally. And this was leadership. And it became an ordinance and a statute before the children of Israel forever. David made sure that you know what? There is equality amongst the camps. Because David knows. As a leader, not everybody is equipped the same. Nobody, not everyone is built the same. And so as a leader, he said, you know what? We are going to take care even of those who, are, who, didn't, know, who didn't go out with us. And it became an ordinance before Israel forever. Listen, when the Lord has given you breakthrough, when you've inquired of him, don't be stingy, don't be mean. When the Lord has given you breakthrough, don't be mean. Even to those who are laughing at you, don't be mean. Even to those who never helped you. You know, there are a lot of believers who are praying like this and saying, Father, when you remember me, God, you know, when you remember the, they will know. Those who are laughing at me, they will see me. Uh, uh, You've been praying for a car. You're saying, well, God, when you bless me with a car, I will never drive with so sister so and so. Drive with them. Let them see that God has blessed you. Let you encourage their faith. Let them know that the God you prayed to is a faithful God. Give them a lift. Let them also know that this God that you prayed for, and they thought that God cannot answer you, he answered you. Let them be partakers of the testimonies that God has presented in your life. Because when you're doing so, there are two things will happen. If, there are, if, if, if these people are your enemies and you're doing this to them, what will happen to them? They will discover, do you know what? We can, uh, if they are your enemies, the Bible says it's like putting out calls on their head. But if it is a believer who did not have faith and you show them, do you know what? God has blessed me with a cow, or God has blessed me with a husband, or God has blessed me, uh, you know, with a child. When you bring them to your testimony, you're telling them, do you know what? As my brother and my sister, listen to me. God works. Faith works. His word is true. His promises are yea and amen. And you get their faith jacked up. 26. Now David came to Ziglag. He sent some of the spoil of the elders of Judah to his friends saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. To those whom were in Bethlehem, to those who were in Ramoth of the south, those who were with, uh, in, in Jatir, those who were in Aror, those who were in, Simfo, in, in uh, Simoth, those who were in Eshtimoah, those who were in Rakal, those who were in the cities of the, of the uh, Jeremalites, those who were in the, uh, in the cities of the Kenites, those who were in, um, in Orma, those who were in uh, Chorasham, those who were in, in Altach, those who were in Hebron, and all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to rove. 31 verses 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Mal Malkishua, Saul's sons. The battle became fierce. Against Saul, the archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come, come and thrust me through the, and, and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, 
he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley, and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. In them. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul, his three sons, uh, fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and amongst the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths and fastened his body on the wall of Beth Shan. Now when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the wall of Beth Shan. And they came to Jabesh and burnt them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So here we see the battle has become fierce as Saul fights with the Philistines. And as uh, uh, the familiar spirit uh, through the Midian uh, uh, spoke about Saul and his sons the previous night, that actually it happened so. And so the destiny of Saul has been uh, fulfilled. Uh, him and his sons are no longer alive. The Philistines have conquered. And... Um, you know, it's like now Israel, Israel is at the masses of Philistines. And by the death of Saul, a new era arises, which is the era of David. And we shall see it as we get into the second book of Samuel tomorrow. Listen, God is a God who has an agenda. You can never fight against the plans of God. You can only align yourself with the plans of God. Do not become like Saul. Just align yourself through obedience. Don't look for many things. You know, there are people who look for a very special word. What is the Lord saying in this generation? No, just do this. Be obedient in the small things that God calls you to align yourself with. As you align yourself in every area of your life, take every situation that comes as a test or as a revelation. Be obedient in those small things. You see, when he was just told, go and destroy the Malachites, Saul thought, you know what? Uh, I will not do everything that God says. He did not know it was a test. If Saul was just faithful in those little things that seemed inconsequential before his eyes, but they were so weighty in the heart of God. If Saul was just obedient in those small things, you see, David was obedient in those small things. David was just obedient. In his relationship with Jonathan, he was obedient. With his, in his relationship with Saul, his enemy, he was obedient. With Akish, he was obedient. He was just being found faithful in every area. With his men, he was obedient. So God was just preparing him and testing him. Preparing him as a leader. Saul failed, and most of us are like Saul. We fail in the small areas of obedience that God has called us in. Don't look for a big thing for you to be obedient for. Don't say, what is the season demanding that I may be obedient to the season as it demands? No, 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 no. Don't do that. Just say, do you know what, God? I'll be obedient in my prayer time with you. I'll be obedient in my study. I'll be obedient in loving my brothers. I'll be obedient in loving the unlovable. As you're just being obedient to his word, God begins to enlarge in your vision, your capacity, and he begins to reveal to you things that now are beyond you, things that affect your family. When you're obedient to that, he begins to unveil and you know reveal things that are greater to you, maybe your ministry, to your society, to the nations. As your level of obedience increases, your level of revelation and, uh, and, and, and you know and insight begins to be opened. So we've come to the end of our reading today and I've said that tomorrow we are kicking off 
to the second book of Samuel. And I believe it's going to be a wonderful uh, journey in uh, Jesus' mighty name. In case of any inquiries, any questions that you have, you can use the numbers that are appearing on your screen. For Kingdom Advancement Giving, the till number is right there, 952737. And as you give, may the good Lord bless and increase you. See you tomorrow as you read the second book of Samuel. You're blessed.